There be a none, it's time for question period. The member for Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker. My question uh, this morning uh, is to the Acting Premier. Acting Premier, under the McGuinty Wynn government, Ontario has lost 300,000 good paying manufacturing yeah. jobs. But that's not all. Not only are we losing jobs at an alarming rate, but for those who have jobs in Ontario's private sector, wage growth is dead last in the entire country. Whoa. While workers in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Newfoundland and none of it are seeing wages climb on a yearly basis, Ontario workers' take-home pay remains stagnant and well below average. While your government has blown this off as a mere transition, in fact, only Tim Hudak and the PCs yeah. have put forward a plan to create jobs, grow our economy, and modernize our labour policies. Where's your plan? Minister, your government is simply Question. limping from crisis to crisis. Why don't you have a full-time jobs plan for Ontario, and why do you believe it's okay for Ontario workers to be dead last when it comes sure. to wage growth in this country? Where's the plan? Deputy Premier. Thank you, Speaker. And, um, I think the member opposite knows this, but just in case he doesn't, we've actually had a net increase of 474,000 jobs. So they can focus on the losses, Speaker, but those losses have been far more than replaced. In fact, a net gain of 474,000 jobs. And I think all of us were delighted to see the job numbers that came out last week. Speaker, what is passing strange, though, is this focus on the right to work for less approach of the party opposite. They talk about increasing uh, income for people, Speaker, but they're taking an approach that has been shown time and time again to reduce income for people. And in fact, some very prominent members of his own party have come out against this plan. Yes, they have. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. You can spin the numbers all you want, but the fact remains Ontario has lost over 25,000 good paying manufacturing jobs since Kathleen Wynne has become the Premier. Uh -oh. The Heinz plan in Leamington is just another example of your careless approach to the Ontario's manufacturing industry, and sadly, it won't be the last. Minister, while you were busy patting yourself on the back, Ontario's government unions like OPSU have grown by over 300,000 new members, while Ontario's private sector unions continue to face layoffs and job losses, losing 100,000 members over the same 10-year period. Minister, over those same 10 years, OPSU elitist Warren Smokey Thomas has forcibly extracted over $500 million in annual dues from his membership. Why does your government choose to stand Question. with union elites like Smokey Thomas instead of the one million people who are out of work in Ontario today? Right on. Yeah. Sit down, please. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, again, strange. The party opposite is advocating further job loss. 2,000 nurses, Speaker, they want to fire. They want to fire 10,000 education workers. That's not a job plan that I don't think the people of Ontario want to see. But let's see what other prominent progressive conservatives have to say about your white right to work for less plan. What John Tory says is, I don't think it's constructive right now. He says, I think it's probably the wrong thing to be advocating, and I don't even think it's going to be that good for the economy. That's your former leader, John Tory. But if that's not good enough, let's talk about Nick Kuvallis. I think you probably know prominent Conservative Nick Kuvallis. He says, if PC members are largely split on right-to-work legislation, then this is not a winner with the general population. Speaker, the member opposite would know that uh, Alberta, under Ralph Klein, Thank looked you. into this and decided against it. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the acting premier. Acting premier, as you know, union elites like Smokey okay. Thomas forcibly extract hundreds of millions of dollars from their members without providing any disclosure or transparency as to where and how that money is spent. It is outdated practices like this that led to my launching our OPSU opt-out website this morning. OPSU opt-out is an opportunity for current and retired OPSU members to go online, leave their comments and feedback, and let us know why they want to opt out of their government union today. Minister, Ontario's middle class has been completely gutted under your Liberal government's watch. 
When will Ontario move forward, stop Question. standing with union elites like Smokey Thomas, and instead remove unnecessary barriers to job creation and modernize our labour policies like Europe, Australia, the UK, and most of the United States have already done? Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I, 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 I'm really baffled by, by the assertions that the member opposite continues to make when it comes to job creation in this province, because what he is talking about is absolutely a job killer, Speaker, in terms of what will happen in this province if they got to bring the right to work for less type of policies Shame. they continue to talk about. The facts are very clear, Speaker. If you look at the United States where they are, the states that they, they have right to work for less type of legislation, what we have seen that there is a net loss of jobs, there is a reduction in wages and benefits for both unionized and non-unionized workers, Speaker, and not to mention their weaker health and safety laws. We will not ascribe to those kind of anti-worker, anti policy, Speaker, and we reject their job killer plan. Sit down, please. Stop the clock. Order. All right, we're starting to raise the temperature. I want to keep it down. The member from the PN Carlton. Very much, the Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Good morning, Minister. Uh, on Saturday, hundreds of people protested your office. They are angry and fed up with increased hydro rates caused by poor government decisions by yourself and others over there. Uh, but the straw that broke the camel's back uh, was quite simply when the Minister of Energy compared the cancellation of the Oakville and Mississauga gas plants as merely a, quote, cup of coffee. As one protester put it, and I'll quote, it's not just a cup of coffee, it's one of our most basic monthly bills. I'm just working to pay them. This careless comparison by the minister proves without a shadow of a doubt that the Liberal Party is not sorry for wasting $1.1 billion in the last election. It also proves the Premier only apologized because she got caught. Will the minister stand in his place and apologize for that careless characterization of the gas plants and that $2 Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, last week the Justice Committee was discussing uh, the costs associated with the re relocation of the Oakville gas plant. The relocation costs have been verified by the Auditor General, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I have said and our party has said that the relocation costs were unacceptably high. The Chair of the Ontario Power Authority provided information to the Committee that the rate-based portion of the Oakville relocation would cost the ratepayer for the 20-year recovery period between $1 and $2 per year, Mr. Speaker. That was from the Chair of the Ontario Power Authority. But I wonder to those 60 or 70 demonstrators who were in front of my constituency office, Mr. Speaker, whether the, uh, the member for Nepean Carlton told them what her leader, okay. Tim Hudak, said when asked to increase or lower rates. He said, I will not do that. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, what the 300 plus protesters told me in front of his office is they can't afford to send any more cups of coffee to Bob Shirelli, Kathleen Wynne, and Dalton McGinty. They told me that they didn't wake up during the 2011 election campaign and say, gee, I wish I could buy the Liberals a cup of coffee for the next 20 years. No, Speaker, they told me that they're having a rough time paying their hydro bills because this government needed to win five seats in the GTA. In fact, it wasn't just the protesters that were seniors and family members. It was also the small businesses who were there that were telling me they're going to have to lay people off or shut their doors entirely because of this Liberal government's terrible and disastrous decisions. Now, the protest on the weekend is just the beginning. I know we're going and to hear more in the next couple of weeks. How does this Liberal government expect to create jobs and the re retain the ones that we have already got in Ontario if their energy policy is the single biggest Biggest factor driving jobs. Thank you. Sit down, please. 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the member didn't tell those 70 or 80 demonstrators the number of mitigation measures we have to reduce the payments on their electricity bills, and she voted against every single one of them. But, Mr. Speaker, with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, industrial prices, Ontario's industrial rates compare favourably with other jurisdictions, despite what she shouts, Mr. Speaker. Industrial rates in Northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada, lower than 44 American states. Industrial states in Southern Ontario are lower than in Alberta, Michigan, New Jersey, and California, and in line with states like New York, Virginia, and Tennessee. And, Ms. Mr. Speaker, they continue to state facts which are totally untrue. Mr. Speaker, they talk about Heinz, Mr. Speaker, leaving because of energy prices, and Heinz actually had I their own generation on site, Mr. Protest. Speaker. They were not paying for the electricity bill. Mr. Speaker, they've got to come straight with the facts. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the biggest yeah. mitigation in making yeah. sure that we can control energy costs in this province is by removing that party from the with respect to industrial energy pricing. Every major corporation will tell you they're wrong. The Premier herself contradicted herself last week in Gas Plants Committee, including the, all of the bureaucrats. And this minister here couldn't even tell us last week whether the energy rates that are going up Shameful. included the cancelled gas plants. It's like a bad episode of Hogan's Heroes over there, Speaker. They know not of what they speak. I can tell you one thing, Speaker. In the next six months, Ontarians will have a choice. They can continue to choose that party who puts politics over people's energy yeah. policy, or they can choose a party, the Progressive Conservative Party under Tim Hudak, who understands that the right the knows how to bring the jobs back, who actually has a plan on the floor of the Assembly. Will the minister adopt our plan, say enough is enough, and apologize to the people of this Thank country? You. Minister. Mr. Speaker, will the member tell the people, and did she tell those 50 or 60 people in front of my constituency office, that she and her party are going to proceed with a $15 billion investment in new nuclear no, that will make it the rate skyrocket, Mr. Speaker? No, she didn't. And did she tell the people in front of my constituency office that she and her party voted against these programs? No, the she didn't. The Clean Energy Benefit. 10% discount no, off the bottom didn't. line. The Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit saves qualifying individuals up to $963 per year with a maximum of $1,097 per year for qualifying seniors. That member and her party voted against those price mitigations that reduce electricity bills, and she should be embarrassed for voting against what's going to help electricity rate payers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. According to the Auditor General, the province sells electricity exports at a loss. Between 2005 and 2011, the loss was $1.8 billion. Can the minister explain to consumers paying the highest electricity prices in Canada why Ontario is selling electricity at a loss? Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member should know that, first of all, uh, from the opposition party, they had uh, accrued a deficit in electricity. Exactly. And they had been importing at the cost of close to a billion dollars a year. We invested heavily in the sector, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to make sure that we had a surplus. Because we have a surplus now, the member should be aware of how the trading in electricity works. Yes, sometimes we sell electricity cheap. Much more do we sell it at a profit, Mr. Speaker. From 2008 to today, the IESO will confirm to him. I'll arrange the meeting for him. We can go through the books. We generated a $6 billion profit in the sale of electricity. Wow. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, for families, it's just another example of a system that isn't working. They saw the Liberal government spend over a billion dollars cancelling private power deals, spend millions more signing contracts for nuclear expansion plans that were never going ahead. The only way to get affordable electricity from Ontario is to move outside the province. Does the minister think that makes sense? Minister of Energy. 
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to read a quote that I'm sure uh, will be of interest to the uh, critic from the NDP. I'm sure it will. Uh, it's from uh, Larry Alderis uh, of the Power Workers Union. Union. Uh, it was great to hear that nuclear power will continue to play a key role in sustaining the province's energy needs into the You're future. Union, Referring to refurbishment, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The units provide a reliable source of safe, clean, and low-cost electricity while also providing a source of highly skilled jobs. The commitment to nuclear in the long-term energy plan will secure great jobs for jobs our current ADP employees support. and hopefully will open the door for more employment opportunities into the future. 25,000 jobs more, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I, I guess answer period is not going to be part of today's agenda. The government talks about doing things differently, but all people see is a lot more of the same status quo thinking. And bills keep climbing higher. Instead of clamping down on private power deals or reining in the growing number of hydro agencies and their CEO salaries, or taking some action to ensure that Ontario isn't exporting electricity for cheap while charging people more and more at home, the government offers more of the same. Does the minister think that's good enough? Mr. Speaker, the member knows that we invested heavily to put ourselves back into a surplus. We've invested heavily to make the system clean. We've totally abolished dirty burn coaling generation, Mr. Speaker. That takes $4.4 billion Catherine off the Fife bottom line of the question. province's expenses in environmental and health care costs. But in the meantime, because of the pressure on prices, Mr. Speaker, we introduced a number of price Catherine's mitigation measures, question, which that party voted against in some, in some cases. The Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, Mr. Speaker, takes 10 per cent off the bottom line. The Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit saves quali qualifying individuals up to $963 per year, with a maximum of $1,097 per year for qualifying seniors. Catherine that Fife member should next. look in the mirror and ask himself why he wants to deprive our seniors of up to $1,000 a year off their electricity bill. Mr. Speaker, that was totally irresponsible. Oh, I was right. Thank you. New question. Thank you the very member for Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this morning, earlier this morning, the government issued yet another vague announcement about reining in public sector CEO salaries. Will the government set a hard cap for the executive salaries? I said to the acting premier. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. But you were yelling. Stop the clock. Order. If I could ask the member to at least declare who she's addressing the question to. To the Acting Premier. Earlier this morning, the government issued yet another vague announcement about reigning in public sector CEO salaries. Will the government set a hard cap for the executive salaries at twice the level of the Premier? Deputy Premier. Minister. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. There was nothing vague about this morning's announcement. We talked about the fact that the government will be moving forward with legislation in the spring when the House returns, which will outline ways in which we can establish a framework, including hard caps for public sector salaries. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, and I think the leader of the third party learned last week with her rather ill-fated press conference, that this is a technical matter, Mr. Speaker. It involves study of what goes on in other jurisdictions. We want to make sure that broader public sector salaries are fair, Mr. Speaker, but they also have to reflect uh, what is needed in that particular situation. As I told the House the other week, the honourable member, uh, the honourable leader of the party, in her press conference, cited an example and then had to swallow herself whole by saying, "Well, maybe there's an exception so for that." Mr. Leader. Speaker, this is not yes, uh, a political ploy. We are actually going to have the work done, and we're going to come forward with a framework which uh, allows for fairness in terms of salaries in the broader public sector. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So protecting the taxpayers of Ontario is not a technical issue. This question is to the Acting Premier. While people feel like they've been falling further behind, they've watched as executives in public sector have seen their paychecks grow by leaps and bounds. The province, province, province promised action, but all we see yet is another plan to have a plan. The minister talks about a hard cap on CEO salaries. If he means what he says, can he tell us what, he, what he's going to cap them at? Minister. Mr. Speaker. 
As I said, uh, we are going to come forward. This is a very clear commitment that we will come forward with legislation which will give government the authority to establish frameworks going forward. And I would stress to the honourable member that that is frameworks for the entire package that uh, senior members of the broader public sector receive, which includes salary, which includes perks, and which includes severance arrangements. I note, Mr. Speaker, that the NDP bill, which the honourable member likes to talk about, did not deal with perks. Did not deal with severance. Mr. Speaker, this is a broad right. study that will take place and will result in a framework. What this legislation does is this legislation gives government the power to impose pa caps and to impose a framework. Mr. Speaker, this is the responsible course of action, and Mr. And Speaker, sir, it is a firm commitment that that legislation will be forthcoming when the House returns in the new year. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, people are tired of watching as, pu as public sector CEOs get pay hikes that are worth more than most families earn every year. Two years ago, this government said they backed a hard cap at twice the pay of the Premier. Two years ago. But they also saw every Liberal MPP vote against a plan put forward by Andrew Horvath to cap salaries at twice the pay of the Premier, joined by the PCs. Now they are making promises again, but without any details of what the cap will be. Why should people believe the minister this time? Mr. Speaker, again, let's, let's talk about the new Democratic Party's bill. The leader of the third party went out and held a press conference. In the press conference, she had to swallow herself whole by outlining an individual who received a substantial salary who she had to admit would have an exception under her bill. Mr. Speaker, this isn't about exceptions. This is about a proper framework. The other difference between our measures and that put forward by the third party, Mr. Speaker, is the third party talked about just the salary. We want to look at perks, Mr. Speaker. We want to look at issues like severance. We want to look at the entire package. Mr. Speaker, this is a complex matter. It's a technical matter. What this bill will do is give government the power to put in force a framework, including hard caps, Mr. Speaker, in a responsible way, which makes sure that taxpayers' money is properly used by the broader public sector. Thank you. New question. The member for Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. Uh, we've been holding uh, economic roundtables all throughout Ontario, and the, Speaker, the news is quite disturbing. Uh, we're seeing company after company pulling up stakes in Ontario and heading to more open for business territories. Your high taxes, unaffordable energy, and red tape are sending these businesses packing. How many U.S. Steel, Caterpillar and Heinz announcements do you need to hear before you actually change the direction Ontario is headed? Acting Premier, we're in crisis mode here in Ontario. When are you going to do something for our struggling business community? Deputy Premier. Finance Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, I recognize the member opposite is making reference to a number of initiatives with his right to work legislation, things that are actually going to kill jobs in our province. We won't stand for that on this side of the House. We're going to take the initiatives necessary to protect those workers for health and safety reasons and at the same, at the same time provide highly valued jobs. That's why our jobs plan includes investing in people, ensuring that they have the skills necessary to succeed. We're going to continue to invest strategically in infrastructure and those initiatives that create jobs, over 100,000 more, Speaker, as a result, and a dynamic business climate. Even Roger Martin quotes, Ontario's well-educated and active labour force is one of the best assets and also one of its primary sources of economic wow. potential, and that was just done last month, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Acting Premier, what I'm referring to actually are your high taxes, your red tape, and your unaffordable energy, which are driving businesses out of Ontario. Ontario. And that's before your energy minister's announcement that our already tripled hydro rates are set to skyrocket over the next five years. Uh, not very encouraging news for business speaker or for families or for seniors. In Northern Ontario, Extrata Copper closed, terminated 672 employees and moved 115 kilometres over the border into Quebec for cheaper hydro. There are 60 mills in the north that are closed. That's 80 per cent of all of the mills in the north are gone, never to open again under this government. Last week, Resolute Forest Products in Fort Francis shut Question. down yet another paper line and sent 60 people home. What is it going to take for you to finally get it? 
Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's be certain now that what we have in this House right now is Bill 105 to support small business. I would look to the critic opposite to ensure that we pass that bill to help small businesses right across this province. Over 90 per cent would benefit. The member opposite also makes reference to energy prices. What we had left over from the Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker, was a $20 billion stranded debt. That's their legacy, and that is still being paid for today by the people of Ontario. When it comes to taxes, Mr. Speaker, again, I quote, Ontario's tax system is now one of the most business-friendly in the OECD. Thanks to the adoption of harmonized sales tax, the elimination of the capital tax, reductions in the marginal effective tax rate, Ontario businesses are well positioned to thrive in a competitive market. The task force applauds the Ontario yes, government for implementing the necessary changes to make Ontario's tax system smarter. We are one of the lowest in the OECD country. That's why countries and businesses are investing in our products. Thank you. New question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Speaker, the committees have finally received the forensic audit document, the document that was completed in June of 2012. It has been a year and a half. I find this time lapse unacceptable. The public has a right to know the content of the audit of what went on at Orange. Yeah. When will the minister see fit to read the report and make it public? Minister of Health. Well, Speaker, I'm, I, I did have the opportunity to read the investigation report, Speaker. Uh, as you know, as I've said many times in this House, I read, I read the interim report. When I received the interim report, that was enough for me, Speaker. What I read in that interim report. Uh, made me realize the right place for this information was the Ontario Provincial Police. That is where that interim report went, Speaker. That's where it belonged. And uh, the, uh, the committee has asked for the forensic uh, uh, investigation report, and they have now received that report. But I think it's worth noting that the committee has had the interim report for months and months and months. Good you. Supplementary. Speaker, the result of the forensic audit belongs to the Minister of Health. She ordered it. She had a duty to read it. She had a duty to read from it, learn from it, and make sure that it never happens again. It continues to show that the minister prefers to hide behind excuses rather than admit it that she should have read the report and she should have released them to Ontarian. There are no excuses for hiding information, for taking away transparency. This is taxpayers' dollars that went into the pocket of private enterprise and of greedy uh, people at Orange. When will the minister make the report finally public to all so that everybody can see the money that was taken away, everybody can learn and everybody can make changes Question. so that Orange never happens again? Minister of Health. So, Speaker, as, as I have said uh, before and I will say again, uh, the ministry officials determined that in an abundance of caution, so as not to jeopardize an OPP investigation, Speaker, that this document be held uh, in the ministry and shared with Orange. The ministry and Orange carefully reviewed that document. But, Speaker, a very high priority for me, uh, now that Orange is on the right track, is to see that justice is done, Speaker, and I in no way wanted, want to jeopardize that investigation. A decision was made by officials. I tell you, I support that decision, Speaker, and if that decision were made again today, I would still support that decision because the OPP investigation must be allowed to continue uh, uh, without any political or any perception of political interference. Thank you. The member for Ottawa, Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Speaker, like residents across this province, those who live in Manitowaj, a township in Northern Ontario, turn to the provincial government to assist resolving issues surrounding infrastructure. I wrote the municipality of Manitowaj was designated as an industrial road in 1963 and operated as such until a forestry company withdrew from the industrial road agreement in late 2012. Unfortunately, the industrial partner entered operations in the area and significantly reduced its maintenance activities on the road in 2010. More recently, the road has been closed since July of this year due to a washout. 
Mr. Speaker, what is the Minister of Transportation doing to help the residents of Manitowage access this important rural road? Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Uh, it's always uh, it's always great to have uh, an engineer in caucus like my friend from Morley's who would uh, who pay such attention and detail to the infrastructure, and I appreciate that. Um, this is Karamit Road that we're talking about in Manitowage. Uh, I have been working, and I, I, I want to uh, acknowledge my friend, the Minister of Northern Development and Mines and the Minister of, of Natural Resources. This has been a complicated and challenging problem. As you know, uh, the road washed out uh, last in just a few months ago, um, and it was not maintained. And you're quite right. There's been a number of jurisdictional issues. It was an industrial private road, and it was a, a, a road nominally maintained by um, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, and the municipality, whose landfill is on the site, uh, Mr. Speaker, has not uh, been interested at all Answer. in taking the road over. So I am pleased to announce that the Ministry of Transportation will open up the road, maintain it, and work with the community to repair the full length of Caramet Road in the coming months, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. I'm pleased to hear that the Minister was able to find a solution for the constituents of Manitowoc. This is an important access point for the residents of Manitowoc, and I know that they will greatly appreciate the support that our government is providing them. It is important that the needs of Northern Ontario are heard and addressed. And this provides an opportunity to highlight what our government is doing in Northern Ontario. A number of my colleagues, including the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure and the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, were in Timmins on Friday for the Northern Leaders Forum. There was great discussion that emerged from that forum that it was very positive for Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, will the minister in, uh, please inform the legislature how our government will continue to build on the positive momentum generated by the Northern Leaders Forum in relation to infrastructure in Northern Ontario? Thank you, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Th thank you very much. Well, Mr. Speaker, whether it's the seven kilometres that we're opening up right away to the landfill for the community of Manitowoc or working over the, over the winter on the larger road, uh, I want to thank all of my colleagues, and particularly the Minister of Northern Development and Mines for the Northern Leaders Forum on Friday, where this and other issues were, were discussed, Mr. Speaker. We have over $500 million, which I think is a record, going into northern roads and highways, our important twinning projects, working with, the, uh, with Northern Development and Mines and Natural Resources to open up those roads for the Ring of Fire and for the, the, the very quickly reviving uh, forestry industry, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank Mayor McKecker, in particular of uh, Manitowoc, and the Council and the people for their patience and for working with our ministry and Mr. Sir. Speaker, to resolve this issue, to get the landfill open and get those services available to the community. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member for Whitby, Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, Ontarians in rural and northern Ontario find it very difficult to access the health care they need, especially in the winter months. Other provinces, like British Columbia, have introduced non-emergency medical transportation programs for people who live in rural and remote communities to make it easier to access their out-of-town medical appointments. British Columbia's North Health Connections program, run by Pacific Western Transportation, is so successful that the number of riders have doubled over eight years. Minister, it's my understanding that Pacific Western has given a proposal to your ministry for consideration. Could you please give me a status report with respect to the proposal? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker. And the member opposite raises a very important question, particularly in Northern Ontario. And the issue is the non-urgent patient transfer, people who need to be transported, but not they don't need the care available uh, by paramedics in a fully equipped uh, ambulance. This is an issue that uh, I have spoken uh, many times with, with the people of Northwestern Ontario in particular, and in fact, the uh, Northwest uh, Lynn is now working on, uh, on resolving the issue so that people get the care they need, Speaker, and we also get the right care, the most appropriate care. So this work is underway right now. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, we all know that Northern Ontarians rely on the Northern Health Travel Grant. Yet your government has increased spending for this grant by 133 per cent without improved customer service. Ontarians are having to wait up to eight weeks to receive reimbursement for medical services, putting Northerners out of hundreds of dollars. Pacific Western Transportation has put forward a proposal that would both save money and improve service. Minister, will you commit today to giving Northern Ontarians more options when travelling distances for health care and adopt Pacific Western Transportation's proposal? Minister of Health. 
Well, Speaker, um, I find it interesting that the member opposite thinks there is one solution to this problem, and in fact, uh, it is much more complicated than that. What I will reiterate, Speaker, is that this is an issue that has been resolved. Uh, the the uh, people in northwestern Ontario are working very hard to find the most appropriate solution for this particular issue. Thank you. New question. The member for Timmins, James May. My question is to the uh, to the uh, deputy premier. Premier, last uh, Friday uh, you gathered in Timmins along with the premier and others for your Northern Leaders Forum, and where the Liberal uh, cabinet and the premier tried to tell Northerners that everything is going to be better now. But as we wake up on Saturday morning, we find out we still have no rail passenger service because your government confirmed, in fact, you're not going to do it. We still have the same bad forest tenure, uh, forest tenure problems that we had before Kathleen Wynne became Premier. We still have the same and actually worst energy policies that we had before Mrs. Wynne became the Premier of Ontario. Uh, we now are going to have a 33 per cent increase in electricity over the next three years, and our northern highways are still downloaded. So can you tell me what is different come Saturday morning after the northern summit than there was Friday morning when you arrived? Deputy Premier. Development mind. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 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 may I say to the member, you were there. You saw what a positive meeting it was in terms of uh, the, uh, the commitment we made uh, to work with Northern leaders, municipal, First Nation, Métis, moving forward on the growth plan for Northern Ontario. Uh, you heard the comments by uh, Northern leaders such as uh, Timmins Mayor Tom Lawren, uh, whom you represent, uh, what an historic occasion this was. And also, you heard certainly a commitment on my part uh, as Minister of Northern Development Mind that indeed we will continue continue to look at all options moving forward for the uh, Ontario Northland uh, Transportation Command. We are committed, uh, and I am committed as Minister, to a, to a sustainable and a viable ONTC, something that makes a lot of sense, and we have changed the, uh, uh, the, the uh, commitment from a, one of transfer to one of transformation. So, Speaker, this was indeed an exciting day. Eight of my colleagues, the Premier was there as well, and an, extor an historic, tremendous day in Northern yeah, Ontario. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, as I said on Friday, nobody's going to say uh, not welcome to Northern Ontario. We're glad anytime somebody comes to visit us, but what we're looking is, where's the beef? Where is there going to be change in the policies that this government has put forward that has hurt Northern Ontario? We lost Extrata. Why? Because of high energy prices in the city of Timmins. We lost forestry jobs. Why? A large part due to your own forest tenure policies that your government put in place. So I ask you again. Tell me one policy that you've changed from Friday morning to Saturday morning as a result of that Northern Summit. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, I mean, uh, uh, the member is being remarkably disingenuous, particularly related to the extraordinary work that we've done with Northern leaders related to the Northern Ontario Growth Plan. I think the member also knows, in terms of the Forest Tenure Modernization Act, we are now seeing involvement by First Nations in a way that we've never seen before in terms of management of our Crown Forests. We've seen new, new companies opening up, and, and that's been an exciting part of it. Stop the clock. Minister, I would ask you to withdraw. I'll withdraw. Oh, is it disingenuous? I'll withdraw. I, I didn't realize that was unparliamentary, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are we are working incredibly closely with our northern leaders, and, and Premier Wynne has made it very clear our commitment is is absolutely not something that we are, we are just talking about. We're working with northerners. We've got a northern cabinet committee put in place so we can put a northern lens on all issues. We had a cabinet meeting in Sault Ste. Marie uh, uh, um, several months ago. We are up there with with eight of our colleagues, including the Premier, meeting with all northern leaders, First Nation, Métis, to continue to work forward on all the uh, economic Thank development you. in the north, including the ring of fire, including working on making the, the best member for the OMP. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, the Honourable Yasser Nagvi. Continuous answer. Speaker, as members of this legislature are well aware, there has been for some time a global economic restructuring occurring. This, of course, affects manufacturing, goods, services, resource allocation, exchange rates, and in particular, labour demand. While the overall economy steps towards improvement, I still encounter constituents in my own riding of Etobicoke North who face particular challenges in the labour market. Though so many aspire, desire, seek and come to Ontario with the promise of a better life, a good job and assured prosperity for their families, 
Nevertheless, particular obstacles remain recruitment fees and bills, and lack of protection under Ontario's strict health, uh, rules of health and safety. Speaker, would the minister please inform this chamber why are certain employers able to continue to circumvent Ontario's labour protections? Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the uh, member from Etobicoke North for uh, a very important question. Speaker, our government is committed to standing up for Ontario's workers because safe and fair workplaces are the building block of a competitive and growing economy. Speaker, as you uh, may recall, just last week, uh, the government tabled uh, a bill uh, uh, to ensure that we are protecting vulnerable workers in our communities across the province. The bill, uh, uh, Speaker, is quite extensive. It makes, uh, it makes it illegal for employers to charge temporary foreign workers recruitment fees or to take away their personal documents like passports. Uh, also, Speaker, the member from uh, Etobicoke North will be happy to hear that we are requiring uh, employers to provide information uh, to their employees about employment standard rights, uh, and we provide that information, Speaker, in 23 different languages besides English and French, wow. languages like Tamil, Hindu, uh, Hindi, uh, Urdu, Punjabi, traditional certified Chinese, and more. And also, Speaker, we are make sure that co-op students, uh, trainees, and unpaid lenders are also covered by Occupational Health and Safety Act through this legislation. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I would like to say shukriya, thank you, to the Minister and commend him for his initiatives and commitment on this file. I will likely be able to return to my riding of Etobicoke North over the break and reassure my constituents that our government has heard their concerns, takes them seriously, and has begun to act. Speaker, safe and fair workplaces have been a hallmark of the province of Ontario, and with such workplace guarantees, prospective employees can focus on earning their daily bread, providing for their family, stimulating the economy, and ultimately building a more prosperous and just society. Even so, Speaker, unfortunately, I continue to hear from workers who have been taken advantage of by their employer. The workers who have worked but have nevertheless been left without pay, often with no recourse, remedy, or redress. Such workers are often unaware of their full rights, and that, of course, is a recipe Question. for disaster. Speaker, will the minister please inform this chamber what is the Ministry of Labour proposing to ensure that hardworking Ontarians are paid for the work they do? Mr. Labour. Thank you, Speaker. And, and, and at his heart, this legislation is very much about making sure workers get paid for the work they have done and giving businesses who play by the rules a competitive advantage. This bill, Speaker, if passed, would remove the current $10,000 cap on the recovery of unpaid wages from a Ministry of Labour uh, order to pay. It would also increase the time limit to recover wages from six months or a year uh, to two years. So workers, Speaker, will be able to get money uh, that they are owed. Uh, Speaker, our in terms of uh, temp agencies, a work which is uh, uh, we should be very proud of because we were the, the first parliament, first government in all of Canada to bring legislation in 2009. We're taking the next step in protecting workers who get employment through uh, temp agency. Uh, Speaker, the proposed legislation will extend uh, joint liability for both unfair wages and workplace injuries, encouraging every business to make sure their workplaces are safe for all workers and that they are treated fairly. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. We know that uh, the Auditor General's report on uh, Orange and the Ministry of Health was scathing about the lack of oversight on the part of the Ministry uh, over Orange. Uh, Multi-millions of dollars were wasted and the lack of oversight rests with the minister. Since then, we've heard often from the minister that things have changed. I'd like the minister to tell us how often she has met with the new chair and the CEO of Orange. Can the minister tell us what the most recent financial statement of Orange is and how much of a deficit is Orange running Question. What will the total budget for Orange be in this fiscal year? Yeah. Minister of Health. 
Uh, well, Speaker, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that I meet regularly with the Chair and with the CEO of Orange. They are very fine people, providing very strong leadership at Orange. Speaker, uh, I can tell you that I'm looking forward to appearing before committee on Wednesday because I'm hopeful, Speaker, at that committee meeting we'll have, be able to have conversations about the improvements in service at Orange, although I suspect that might not be where the member opposite will want to take that conversation. But I look forward, Speaker, to, the, uh, uh, to the getting the report from the committee. I look forward to getting the legislation passed, Speaker. So uh, the uh, Orange is under new leadership. It's got a very strong. It's in a very strong position. It is saving lives, Speaker, every single day. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I didn't hear anything about the numbers. Obviously, the minister hasn't read her briefing notes about Orange and what the deficit is. I'm going to make this actually very simple. This is this is a very recent document that orange issue, and it is an RFP for the replacement of the interiors of the AW-139s. Speaker, this is going to involve multi-millions of new dollars for orange. I'm going to ask the minister this very precise question. Has the minister read that RFP, and does the minister know what the cost of that new installation for the 10 AW-139s will be, no. and what will it do to the deficit? Question. Of Minister of Health. Well, Speaker. Uh, Order. Sit down, please. I don't want to lose control. Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker. And what I'd like to know is, uh, has the member opposite read any of the 1.5 million pages of documents that have been submitted to the committee? Wow. It's pretty clear he all. hasn't read you the read interim report of the forensic investigation because they asked for it again. They already had it. They asked for it again. I think that indicates maybe they didn't read it the first time. Wow. But, Speaker, if the member opposite like is suggesting that we do not replace the interiors, then I completely disagree with him. It's essential that patients being transported get the best possible care. That does require uh, making changes to the interior. So I, uh, I endorse Orange moving forward with, uh, with uh, retrofitting the interiors of those helicopters, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member for Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier as well. Autism Ontario and all clinical experts in the field recognize the overwhelming evidence that early intervention and services for children with autism are critical. However, Patricia Dunkley from Niagara Falls has been facing huge challenges in getting appropriate help for her four-year-old son, Nathaniel. He has developmental delays and exhibits behavior that are similar links to autism. Nathaniel, nearly four years old, is trapped on a wait list to see a specialist, a wait that often exceeds two years. Deputy Premier, if your commitment to autism is well demonstrated, as you say, why is Nathaniel being forced to wait during this critical time in his development? Deputy Premier. The Minister of Children and Youth Services. The Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for bringing forward uh, this issue and, and this case. And we, uh, we agree that early intervention is critical to improving outcomes for eligibility for IBI. Absolutely, that's right. And we're determined to make further progress. That's why we've made investments in autism. We've made changes to the program. We removed the previous government's age six cutoff for eligibility. There's been a 114% increase in funding for autism. And this year, we invested over $185 million in autism services. I do meet with parents with children with autism, and I recognize that they face unique challenges, Speaker. We will continue to increase our investments. We will continue to work with our partners um, in, the, uh, in the sector as well. While we continue to increase our investments, though, we know we recognize that the prevalence of autism has gone up as well. One in 150 children Answer. used to be diagnosed. That has increased to one in 88. We know that there's more to be done. We have a clinical expert committee looking at how our services are, are delivered, the view to delivering services in smarter ways to reduce wait lists. Thank Supplementary. you. Supplementary. 
Thank you again, Speaker. Um, I'm going to go back to the Deputy Premier. So, without an official autism diagnosis, you're well aware that Nathaniel is ineligible for any government funding that would have a life-changing impact on his development. Even after receiving a diagnosis, there is that significant wait list for accessing treatment, multi-year delays for diagnosis and access to appropriate treatment is unfairly harming the long-term well-being of young children like Nathaniel with autism. What is this government going to do for children like Nathaniel, whose entire life will be negatively impacted by these unacceptable wait times for diagnosis and treatment? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, with respect to autism, we've tripled the number of children receiving intensive behavioral intervention. We recognize that there are waiting lists, Speaker, and that's why earlier this year we invested an additional $5 million for autism intervention program. This will help create additional spaces, relieve waitlist pressures, and help more children and youth get the help they need. The member for Hamilton Mountain, that. would you come to Our order? Committee, our clinical expert committee is currently reviewing barriers to early intervention and access to diagnosis with a view to identifying opportunities for improvement. The committee is made up of top researchers, academics, and clinical experts and will advise the government on the latest research with a view to enhancing services. We remain committed to helping all our families and all our children achieve as much as they can. Answer. New question to member for Scarborough Agent Court. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. I understand last year, Mr. Speaker, the City of Toronto took the first step in an e-service strategy with the implementation of a reload debit card as a method of payment to Ontario Works. Sounds like an interesting project, Mr. Speaker. I have some concerns. I believe last year the opposition party talked about a debit card for social service assistance recipient, and they restricted the recipients to how they spend the money. I believe that the opposition party thinks that it was somehow magically that whether you could buy carrots or buy chips or control how Ontarians can choose to make choices. Putting this aside, Mr. Speaker, it sounds really impractical. And Mr. Minister, can you please tell the House how is the debit card currently being used in the City of Toronto? Are there any restrictions on the social assistance recipients? Here, here. Thank you. Minister? Well, thanks uh, very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for her question. And provide assurance to all members of the House that there are absolutely no restrictions on what recipients uh, uh, can invest or spend their money on that they receive from the uh, provincial government. Um, as with other payment methods, uh, recipients are, are free to do what they want with their own money. Now, The majority of social assistance recipients receive their money through direct bank deposits, but there are some recipients who, for one reason or another, don't have a bank account. That's why these uh, reloadable cards are made available, and it's a, a very convenient way, and it's worked out very well in the City of Toronto. We want to make sure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, uh, clients understand uh, that it's helpful to have a relationship with a financial institution, but if they don't, we'll do everything and anything we can to assure that they get the money that they have coming to them and they can invest it, and spend it in the way they want. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, the Minister, for that response regarding Ontario recipients can choose their method of payments on reloading the debit card, but also have the same freedom as all Ontarians, the freedom to spend their own money as they see fit. And I know that in my riding of Scarborough Asian Court, the residents will be pleased to know that there are options regarding reloading debit cards and will enable them to help to, uh, to manage the money. Overall, the reloading debit card seems like a great idea, Minister. They also provide flexibility and more choices. It also allows the families and individuals to decide how they want to spend the money and how they uh, manage the money. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please inform the House if the reloadable uh, debit cards are something that other municipalities are considering? Minister? Speaker, it is a great idea. It's a pilot project that's worked very well in the City of Toronto. Uh, we're prepared to look at it for other municipalities should they want to do that because we believe that's the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member for Harry Simon Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Acting Premier, last week the plant manager of Kimberly Clark in Huntsville, Renee Landry, wrote me concerned about high electricity prices. He writes, quote, 
Our annual electricity cost is approximately $4.5 million, Whoa. and current rates in Ontario are among the highest in North America. The most relevant measure of electricity pricing for KC Huntsville is how we compare with other KC facilities, our competition for finite capital and job growth. Kimberly Clark Huntsville Mill has the highest per unit electricity cost of any KC tissue mill in North America. Whoa. If electricity rates do not become more affordable, Ontario risks losing important investments from companies like Kimberly Clark. Close quote. Translation, Question. you're risking losing even more jobs because of your high energy prices. Terrible. Acting Premier, what do you say to Kimberly Clark? Deputy Premier. Order, please. Uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, what I would say to the member is I'm more than pleased to meet with the uh, manager of Kimberly Clark uh, at his convenience uh, to uh, review his, uh, his energy file. Uh, I can tell you that there are significant numbers of uh, industrial companies across Ontario who are accessing demand response. Uh, and uh, demand management uh, to reduce their energy in a very significant way. And I'm happy to review those uh, those uh, opportunities with him. In addition, Order. you know the uh, letter makes reference to uh, the member for uh, to Nip 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 come to and order. I said uh, earlier uh, uh, this after or this morning, Mr. Speaker, uh, that uh, industrial rates uh, in Northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada and lower than 44 American states. Answer. Uh, and industrial rates in southern Ontario are lower than in Alberta, Michigan, New Jersey, and California, and in line with states like New York, Virginia, and Tennessee. But the bottom line is I'm more than happy to sit down and meet with them to review his energy file and see what we can do to accommodate him. Supplementary. Well, uh, I, I, to the to the minister, I'll take you up on that offer uh, because uh, you know we've watched company after company pick up and move their operations to provinces and states that have energy prices that are cheaper. And Kimberly Clark is a big employer in the town of Huntsville. 174 highly skilled Ontarians go to work there every day to produce Kleenex brand facial tissue. This letter from the plant manager is a warning, loud and clear. He goes on, quote, Reliable and affordable energy is essential going forward to help ensure a more competitive business climate, which will help create jobs and bring economic growth to the province. Close quote. So, Minister, how do you expect our companies, factories, and job creators to compete when they are forced to pay some of the most expensive hydro costs in North America? Minister of Energy. As I indicated, I'm very willing to, uh, to meet with the uh, manager that you referred to. I have a quote here from the uh, Canadian manufacturers and exporters of Ontario. The long-term energy plan review responds to a key priority for Canadian manufacturers and exporters of Ontario by providing greater clarity and certainty for manufacturers with respect to electricity rates going forward. The CME supports new initiatives to enable manufacturers to better manage their energy and associated costs. Importantly, the long-term energy plan will reduce overall system costs, which ultimately translates into more competitive forward rates for businesses. And I'm happy to meet with them and see whether there's anything we can do more immediately. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member for Toronto, Dan Ford. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Education. In January of this year, the hardworking men and women who ensure that our schools are safe and clean signed a memorandum of understanding with this government. This memorandum of understanding contained important provisions regarding disability benefits for injured or sick workers, provisions that are being ignored by a number of school boards. At a time when this government is making the centralization of education bargaining one of its top priorities, how does it explain to these hardworking men and women that a signed agreement with the Liberal government is not worth the paper it's written on. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to respond to the question. As, as you know, um, the, uh, we worked very hard when we first uh, took office under uh, the leadership of Premier Wynne to work with uh, 
a whole host of education sector uh, workers in order to make sure that we had memorandum of understanding with all of them. And in fact, over the course of that period, we were able to uh, achieve agreements with uh, all of the teachers unions, uh, with uh, the support workers, the education support workers represented by QP, by OSSTF, by ETFO, and in fact by the eventually with the education support workers that were uh, that were uh, and, sir, represented by various other unions. What's interesting about this speaker is that in fact the details vary from memorandum of understanding to memorandum of understanding so that the details with different unions are uh, do Thank you. vary. Supplementary. Well, Minister, it may be true that details vary from memorandum of understanding to memorandum of understanding, but any successful collective bargain bargaining relationship has to assume that once a deal is struck, all provisions in that agreement are honoured. The problem with the MOU that you signed or that your government signed with the province's education support workers is that a number of local boards are simply not honouring the disability provisions. They don't have the money. This in turn is causing enormous difficulties for many sick and injured support workers, most of whom are making less than $40,000 a year. At a time when this government is asking hundreds of thousands of teachers and support workers Question. to put their faith in centralized bargaining, how, do, how does this government explain a signed promise that was never honoured? Minister? Yes. Um, well, actually, though, I don't think you were actually listening to quite what I said, which is that there are different uh, details depending on whether the education support workers uh, are with OSSTF, whether they're with ETFO, or whether uh, they are with QP. So that in this particular case, the discussion is uh, around some of the one of the areas in which the details between the three MOUs vary, and the understanding that various people have of the difference in the details between the uh, the three different templates that uh, go with the three different unions. Thank you. I beg to inform the House I have laid upon the table the 2012 Annual Energy Conservation Progress Report, Volume 2, from the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m.